I think it's become more commonly understood that sexual abuse and assault and uh, just bodily violation or, uh, you know, the, the violation of someone's boundaries um, is far more common within yoga um, uh, classes uh, than maybe people would even, even, it it's, would, actually, it's actually the norm. It's actually, actually the norm. And that's so upsetting. Right. I mean, I, I can't express how upsetting that really is. And especially if you are a yoga practitioner like yourself. And so this is, this is okay. So this is my question for you. So you've been doing this for a very long time. What I find more, almost more disturbing than the actual abuse that I'm seeing is the ways in which people rationalize, gl- right. gloss over, just completely excuse it. Because I see this in family dynamics where you have an abusive father, abusive whoever, and the family just sort of, well, you know, we don't want to cause any problems. Let's just pretend it doesn't exist. And right. we see that in all kinds of group dynamics. Or it goes farther than that. It goes, let's not, let's pretend that it doesn't exist. Uh, it can go, it can flip into, uh, well, actually, these are signs of love. Mm. Yeah, and, that's incredibly and, disturbing. And one of the, and one, and one of the, one of the uh, uh, cult researchers that I uh, cite in my book and that I really appreciate is Janja Lalich, who describes that particular flip uh, in terms of, um, her phrase is, bounded choice or bounded reality where um the 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 basic premise is that anything that the charismatic leader does uh is reinterpreted uh to be of benefit to the to the group member or to the you know the student or the client or whatever so uh if they physically injure you they're teaching you something about your body uh, about the vulnerability of your body. If they sexually assault you, then they are, you know, they're freeing your psychological hangups that have to do with sexual trauma. If they financially abuse you, then they are, um, you know, they're, they're helping you get over the illusion that money is worth something, right? So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's a number of ways that the, the ways of, of, of abuse rationalization are well documented within, uh, the cult literature and, um, and, and, and they're, they're, they're part of the MO of how, of how groups like this end up working. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I interrupted you though. No, I think I was just sort of pointing to, I think I was just saying something about the documentary that came out recently on Netflix about, uh, Bikram yoga. Right. right. And it was interesting watching that because all the interviews they were doing with, with the women that were assaulted by him, um, and the other people that were there that knew what was going on, but they just, like you said, they rationalize it. They even see it as, oh, he's being loving and how he, you know, is, is, as you say, with the body posture corrections or, or um, touching the body, you know, in your writing, for instance, I read this where I think you mentioned an injury that you had where somebody uh, pushed you into a, p- a pose more deeply and actually, you know, you injured your back. Right. Um, and you, I think you maybe even said that you rationalized the injury. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and so uh, the, 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 the premises of the implied consent space or the somatic dominant space is that the teacher has ownership over your body, but also mystical insight into what your body needs. And so you, uh, you, you, uh, you ostensibly abdicate agency and autonomy at the door. Like that's the way it's been over the last 50 years or so that I do want to make the point though, that that's changing in the culture Mm -hmm. through some very powerful uh, new social movements that are gaining some traction, not enough and not fast enough, I don't think, but, but, but yeah, I mean, so, so I've had the, I've had the personal experience of a senior teacher within the Iyengar world, which is kind of like the, I don't know, the, the, the Harvard of yoga, uh, um, without warning and without, uh, uh, explaining why he was doing what he was doing. Uh, he torqued my spine in a very uh, sort of sharp and acute fashion, uh, to, to the point where, to the point where like there was a, you know, the sound of Velcro ripping all the way up my spine. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, is that, um, 
it happens so quickly and it's so sharp and we can have paradoxical injury or pain responses uh, that give us mixed messages. So uh, in my in my interviews with practitioners, uh, as you know, I compiled my book and I've done, you know, sort of other research projects, it's not uncommon t- for the practitioner to say that it felt pleasurable to be assaulted in such a way that that they would be flooded with you know, adrenaline or, or internal opiates, or what I remember is feeling this rush of warmth throughout me, uh, as I fell to the floor actually. And my first thought was, I actually hope he comes back and does that to me on the other side. And, and it was by reflecting on that, that I could really understand the capacity within those spaces for, uh, what's known as trauma bonding or the capacity of, a victim of physical violence to actually feel neurologically that what's better to do in uh, a given circumstance spontaneously is to seek more care from the abuser uh, or to fawn in front of them or to immediately believe because the cognitive dissonance is so radical that what they've done is actually loving instead of dangerous or instead of instead of uh, violating. So yeah, uh, that's a, that's a very clear personal experience for me. And I think it's replicated in many of the elite environments of yoga practice all over the world, especially amongst those who professionalize into the industry because they have to do like really hard trainings with very charismatic people. Um, but let me turn to this. Let me, let me turn to, to, you know, why does this person have power in the room? Because that's where we get closer to the, um, the, the, the pervasion of cultic dynamics in yoga and Buddhist communities. And I think it's super important for uh, people who are doing ecological activism to start looking at this carefully, because in the yoga and Buddhist worlds, uh, there are no scopes of practice. There are no um, sort of codes of informed consent for why people teach certain things or why teachers suggest interventions for students. There are no regulatory agencies. There's no, there are no tests for competency. Um, and so in unregulated, uh, environments, uh, the only thing that has real currency is charisma. The only thing that allows a uh, a, a figure, usually a male figure in the yoga and Buddhist worlds to rise to some kind of prominence is, uh, the, the phenomenon, the social phenomenon of charisma. And this is not a personal quality of the individual. Uh, it is a social phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's a way in which people respond to a particular kind of activity, uh, within a bound group. And so, um, What I, you know, what I hope my particular study of charismatic leadership and the cultic dynamics that surround it in the yoga and Buddhist worlds is helpful for as we move into deeper into into collapse awareness is that we'll be able to see that in the field of climate crisis discourse, the same kind of landscape applies. Uh, There is no sort of measurement for competency. There is no, you can't get a degree in, in in, in collapsology where, where you have peer reviewed support. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You can't, you can't, you know, you can't, um, uh, uh, there's, there's no, there are no regulatory agencies that give you permission to talk about collapsology in a, a legitimate or a safe way. And if, and if somebody uh, you know, uh, begins to lead a social movement in eco activism that, uh, is, you know, has ethical issues or becomes abusive of its membership. Where's the accountability going to be? It's kind of like a wide open field, a wild west field. And, and, um, I hope that, that some understanding of what's happening in a similar field, uh, which is also about waking up to reality, which is also about self-regulation, which is also about apparently trying to form healthy communities. I hope that data from that experience over the last 50 years will be useful here, because what I see uh, emerging in 
the the movements that I think we, you and I are like very interested in and that we're proximal to is we're seeing the rise of charismatic figures. Uh, and I'm not saying they have negative intentions. I'm not saying that I, I distrust any of them, but I am saying that we've got to be aware of the power of the charismatic phenomenon in leadership uh, situations. And we have to be aware of how cultic dynamics function so that we don't tear each other apart as we try to actually, you know, come closer together in community uh, at the end of the world.